My name is Simone Kluge and this is The Mother Podcast. So what is grief and how do we deal with grief, especially when we deal with the loss of a mother? This is a question I asked myself when I lost my mother in 2016 and was going through the process of dealing with my own grief. So in early 2019, I decided to start The Mother Podcast to try and find out how other women like myself have dealt with their grief. So every month I will interview a different female and find out what has helped them deal with their loss. I hope that this will be an open space for these women to speak about grief, death, and more importantly, mother loss. So for anyone tuning in, I hope these conversations will give you an insight on how to deal with losing someone you love, especially your mother. This is The Mother Podcast. Welcome back to episode four of The Mother Podcast. It has been a long while since my last podcast episode. Um... I think it's been since August, but it's 2020, new year, new resolutions. Mm-hmm. And I've decided I'm dedicated this year to just making sure every month I have a new uh, session. And today I'm joined by the amazing and wonderful <laughs> Nene. <laughs> Thank I'm you. I'm so Hello. excited to have you on uh, for this next Thanks episode. Thanks for having me. I think it's been a while. Like, I've seen you so many times. I've been like, I need to get you on. Yeah. I want to have you on here. Yeah. Um, just a bit about how, how, how we know each other. How do we know each other? Uh, we've known each other for a while. I mean, yeah. like you said, you know, we've seen each other like many times, mm-hmm. but we actually met through uh, our mutual friend, Jess. Yes, Jesslyn. Jesslyn, who you've known longer than I yes. have. I went to uni with Jesslyn. Yeah. So she's one of my closest friends and I guess yours as well. Yeah. And I think that's how we met. So we probably, it was probably through one of those amazing barbecues. Barbecues, yes. Uh, so I think I've, no, I've known went. you for maybe it's been like over oh, ten years. Yeah, is it ten years? I was gonna say five years. Ten, think, yeah, it's been, it's been. I've known Jess for over ten years, yeah. so I reckon during that time, that's yeah. when we probably ten met. Years. Yeah. And tell us a bit about yourself. So, what do you do? What are you? What, are uh, what do I do? So, I work in retail okay. as a project manager for a fashion brand. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of uh, my job, but that's I will probably talk about what I enjoy the yeah. most mm-hmm. out of my job is the traveling part. So I get yeah, to travel to so you're many. Yeah, always traveling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So traveling is one of my passions, and mm. uh, that comes in with the perks of the job. So yeah. the whole notion of like meeting people, meeting yeah. new cultures, and discovering new places. I've mm. always been fascinated by that. Yeah, you know? and yeah, so that's what I do in terms of job. And about me, um, so I'm originally from. Guinea, West yes. Africa. Yes. Um, I've been living in London for almost 20 years now. I spent mm-hmm. part of my childhood in Guinea. Um, mm-hmm. I am a child of four. Child of four, okay. So I'm like the second oldest okay. child of four. So I have two brothers, a sister. So, so you're kind of like the middle, bit, kind of a middle child. The middle ish. child, the first daughter. But yeah. You know, oh, the first daughter? Yeah. Okay. That comes in with like a few, you yeah. know. <laughs> Perks. <laughs> perks and maybe yeah. not so much perks, like yeah. responsibilities. Yeah. But yeah, so two boys, two girls. Okay, so you're uh, the middle, yeah. middle child. And yeah. coming back to, I guess, why, because obviously Mother Podcast is all about dealing with mm. like, death and mother loss. And I specifically remember, actually, I remember, because I, I wasn't that, I didn't know you that that well. And obviously mm. I've known Justin since I was like in school. And I remember her saying to me, this was before my mum passed. I think your mum passed... Maybe a few years. What year was it? Uh, 2014. 14, so two years before my mum. Yeah. And I remember Justin saying, uh, like, Nana's mum wasn't well, and my mum's passed away. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh my, like, oh my gosh, etc. And I'll never forget when I came to Justin's barbecue, and it was the first, <laughs> it was the first time I'd seen you, and my mum had obviously, I think maybe it had been two months since she passed. Yeah. I remember I came with my brother, and yes, in Ghanaian tradition, we wear all black. Yes, I remember, yeah, yeah. Um, so you wear all black for a year it happened until your mum passes away. Mm-hmm. And I remember like coming in and just saying hi to everyone. And I just looked at you. And you, uh, you know, if when your mum has passed, just look at a person and I, I knew you knew what I was going through. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't even have to speak or I didn't even, even have to talk. And mm-hmm. it was just that kind of like, you 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 get you get where I'm coming yeah. from, et cetera. We had, I remember we had a long conversation yes. as well. And I just thought, gosh, like, you just knew straight away. Yeah. Um, but even before that, when yeah. I heard about your mom passing, mm-hmm. I reached out to you, I think, on Facebook. And yes, I said, did, yeah. Because I think it was yeah. a time where you were in Ghana. Yes, yeah. And uh, you were going through these things. And it's, it felt so familiar because that's mm. also something I went through. I mean, we can go yeah. more into details. Yeah. But uh, 
yeah and then when you then asked me to come into the podcast we had these long conversations yes, and I we felt were like okay it's been long overdue yeah and yeah I've been looking forward to yeah. to come in and share because I think that's part of the process exactly sharing. and I think also the fact that you lost your mum in your 20s mm. um how old are you 20 25 25 I guess mm. I was 28 so I think it's kind of a sim- around the similar kind of time and I think for any woman or man tuning in that's in their 20s I think it's good to kind of hear what you went through and what led your mum's passing and also mm-hmm. how have you how you've evolved and how you've coped and what's been difficult and also what have you what have you learned what have you learned through through the like grieving process yeah. so tell me a bit more about your mum what was your mum's name oh gosh <laughs> uh, my mum's name was Mariama Mariama uh to be honest I don't think an hour is enough to talk about yeah, her, no. her <laughs> but I'm just gonna say that she was I'm going to sound cheesy and say the best mom, yeah. the most amazing mom, mm-hmm. but as a person um she was everyone's mom. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and she was everyone's person. Yeah. You know, I come from a big family, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, there's four of us in terms with my siblings, but my mom on my mom's side she had eight siblings. Wow. Yeah. So we're used to kind of having big get-together, family mm-hmm. get-togethers and she was that person that was holding everyone together. Yeah. She was that pillar, yes. you know, at Some home, yeah. at get togethers, at social event, mm-hmm. whatever. Um but on top of that, she was very, you know, she was family was for her was everything to yeah. her. Mm-hmm. So my mom didn't really, you know, go into further education, didn't have a specific job. So she dedicated her life to family. Mm-hmm. And she, you know, she was one of the smartest, you know, brightest students at school. Yeah. She graduated from one of the best schools at the time. So my mom's from Sierra Leone, by the yeah. way. So she graduated from one of the best schools in Sierra Leone. She could have gone on and invested in her further education, but mm. she met my dad. She met my dad quite young. Okay. How old was she? Uh she was 20, 1920 Tw- at the time. 20, okay. Yeah. And uh since then she then, you know, dedicated her time to just being a you know a housewife but also that support for the whole family mm-hmm. um it's not until after we all graduated from uni that she decided to invest more into further education okay. so she was more she was going to the open university but she's always been interested in social issues so mm-hmm. she will you know read the news like read the newspaper and mm-hmm. always educate us about stuff that i didn't you know, yeah. know like mm-hmm. from outside she would always be in the news and know everything that was going on but she was always interested in like charitable courses and what mm-hmm. have you even back in Guinea. Mm. So at the time when she decided to go back into further education, mm-hmm. she also took on the role to be involved with the Red Cross. Oh wow. So she I was working that. for the Red Cross at the time mm-hmm. which, you know, until she passed. Mm-hmm. So all of that, you know, sort of brings out her character and what she was passionate mm-hmm. about yeah. and what she was dedicated to from mm-hmm beginning to so real you know, like social change because I know really, amongst yeah. you like what I admire but between like you and your siblings that like, you've all you're always traveling like you're, yeah. in, in terms of that that the core of that like, education like, yeah I think your sister's she's where she's where, where she's, she's in she's, Chicago think, she's in Chicago yeah. I just finished doing her masters yeah she's working now yeah. so education has always been a big deal yeah. to her and to my dad to my parents so they've invested most of their life in our education yeah. so for her she was like right now that my children are like you know grown and stuff now mm-hmm. I can focus on me yeah. you know so that's who she was as a person but also in terms of personality she was very discreet elegant yeah. and yeah. classy and really did things in a big way but in a sort of quiet way okay. i don't know if that makes sense yeah yeah uh it's not until after her passing that i realized how much she actually had an impact yeah. on people and yeah. the communities that she was involved in mm. so it's only like you know later that you realize yeah and something exactly what you mean that you know? actually one person can make such a so in a nutshell difference. yeah <laughs> <laughs> without going into details that's uh who that, she was that's that's i think it reminds me a lot of you because i think that you are i would say you're so incredibly poised i think the way you you carry yourself with such elegance and such grace and i'm sure that's a reflection of oh thank you of of her thank you um can i ask what led to her passing if you can as much as you want to Like yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. So, um with my mom, it's 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 actually strange. It's one of those things that, you know, you can't really explain because mm. she's always um complained about back pain. So, it started off with back pains yeah. uh for a few years now before um she passed. That would come and go. Yeah. You know, 
usually you have the typical back pain and you, you go and get mm. some massages. Yeah. We'll take her to the osteopath to a specialist and then it will go away yeah. and we'll come back. Mm. So it's not until in 2000, towards the end of 2013, mm-hmm. where she started to complain more consistently about these back pains. Mm. And then I remember my dad would take her to the hospital and they would do run like different tests. And at that point, they even ran tests for like to check whether she had bone cancer. And yeah. You couldn't Some, find anything. Mm. And in between that time, we will book in physios and what have you, mm. and then we'll come and goes. And there was that, there was a specific moment that really, that I found really surprising because sometimes with the back pains and with my mom, she's the type of person who, even if she's in pain, she will never show. Yeah. She will one. always have that strong sort of like, you know, you know, persona about yes, her. You will yeah. never feel it. You're mm-hmm. like, you're thinking, okay, she's a mom, she's a super, you know, super woman, she can do anything. Mm-hmm. And I remember uh, it was um, Boxing Day, Mm. uh, 26th of December, 2013. Because my mom loved window shopping. We always used to go window shopping. And Mm -hmm. she then told me, because I wanted to go window shopping with her at that Mm. point. And then she told me, I'm sorry, I can't go with you because I can barely walk. Mm. And that for me was a bit shocking. I was like, mom, but you love to walk. You're always walking around everywhere. You're like, you know. I'm the one who gets the most tired. And then she was like, I can't (laughs) go with you. You go if you find anything interesting. Um, come back and like you know get something from me you yeah. know how they say back home just get something yeah just get me. get me something yeah um, and then I went and then that was that always stuck at the back of my mind I was like it's really weird this mm. is a weird back pain I've never heard anything like that mm. and then I didn't hear anything back afterwards then in January uh, it was around January mid-January 2014 I think she was having like dinner with my dad they decided to order takeout Mm. And in between that time, she was still going on her classes, even yeah. classes for the open at the open university. And uh, she had Chinese takeaway. Yeah. I remember that like as if it was yesterday. <laughs> she because she loved Chinese takeaway. Mm. And after she had, she ate the food. I think it was a couple of hours later. Mm. She started complaining of a stomachache. Mm. And didn't really think too much of it. I was like, okay, let me just sleep over it. It will pass. Mm-hmm. And then she went back to class the next day. Oh, wow. So on her way back, mm-hmm. um, she called my dad at the station. She said, can you come and pick me up? Mm. Because I can't actually walk to the station anymore. And mm. my dad was like, okay. And then he picked her up. They came back home and she was like, I'm having these pains. Uh, I think we need to go to the hospital. He was like, okay. And then he took her to the hospital. Mm. And I think at that point, that's, a re- that's where they realized that it was not any normal kind of pain and then mm-hmm. they realized that they noticed that she had jaundice okay that's why they were like right we're going to take you to the emergency and then that was on the 22nd of january mm-hmm. 2014 mm-hmm. they took her to the, to the hospital they admitted her in and everything they ran different types of tests or what have you i think at first they thought it was gallbladder okay then they ran several tests they ran all sorts of tests yeah hepatitis whatever mm-hmm. everything came out negative and then they decided to run MRI, CT scan, and that's when they discover a tumor. Mm-hmm. And she was diagnosed with um, bile duct cancer. Okay. Now, bile duct cancer is, if you know, you're not familiar with it, is one of those rare forms mm-hmm. of cancer. Mm-hmm. It's typically um, picked up at the late stage, so okay. it's one of those form of cancer untraceable. that's it's not untraceable. untraceable. It's hard to find. Yeah. Hard to find, and typically, I think they were saying that it happens with every 1,000 people in the UK. Wow. So one of those rarest form of cancer actually related to liver cancer, mm-hmm. and um, it's one of those things that once you pick it up, it's probably at the late stage. So at the time when they told us that mm. that's what it was, mm-hmm. um, it was the first, my first reaction was, this is really strange. Mm-hmm. Liver cancer, this only happens to people who drink, smoke, whatever. My, yeah. mem- my mom was like one of the fittest yeah. piss people. That's what I thought, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, around, she never drank, never smoked, was super active, mm. ate so healthy. I remember even the African food she used to cook for us, she used to stick up the skin, we yeah. ate a lot of vegetables. Mm-hmm. So it's one of those things that you just don't understand. Mm-hmm. And um, her first, I remember her first reaction was, again, really strong, really calm, mm-hmm. collected, say, we're going to get through do this. Do you remember how your parents told you? Do you remember that moment? Uh, my mom was still at a hospital. Mm-hmm. It was, I remember, my, I was at work. My sister called me. Mm-hmm. 
And then she, because we were waiting for, once she got admitted at the hospital, we were waiting for uh, the results of the test, the different tests yeah. that they were running. Because at first we thought it was gallbladder. No, it's not gallbladder. But then they went back and they ran more tests. They mm. ran a CT scan and they then ran a biopsy, which is when you take a sample and you yeah. mm. um, analyze it. And then my sister, my younger sister is the one who called me at work and they said that apparently, you know, when they apparently, say okay. apparently it's cancer. Yeah. So when... When you first hear that, your first thought is it might not be because, you know, when you think of cancer, you never think that it's something that will happen to to someone close to you or to you. So you hear about it in the movies, you hear maybe someone that you know, you know, Mm -hmm. but you never hear about it. So when you hear the word, apparently there's that glimpse of hope where you feel like, okay, it's apparently it might not be that. Yeah. And then it's not until my dad came back from the hospital Mm. and he might my mom was still um, admitted so she stayed at the hospital Mm. and I remember my dad walked in in the kitchen Mm. corridor and we were all sitting there and he couldn't speak yeah it's the first time that I saw my dad just Mm. break down and Uh I thought oh my god yeah that's when I really thought okay this is real yeah you know Mm. and so that's how we were that's how we found out and that's how we were um, informed so in between that time we were thinking about different options. First mm-hmm. of all, we were thinking about second opinion. Yeah. Um, because that's the first thing you think about, whether it's actually legit. Mm-hmm. It's right. Mm-hmm. So we sent through her files to many different hospitals, mm. including the U.S. Um, at the time, um, it was something that my mom, um, it was a discussion that my mom didn't necessarily want to share with everyone. So okay. we sort of kept it within the family, within the four yeah. five, mm-hmm. four of us. Mm-hmm. And um, so in between that time, we were looking for like second opinion mm. in the U.S. He even sent documents to Asia, yeah. hospital in Asia to check. And Is they all came to... back with the same thing. Mm-hmm. That it's bowed out cancer. It's late mm-hmm. stage. Um, there's nothing you can do because one of the options with bowed out cancer is you can have surgery. Yeah. If you pick it up quite at a quite early stage, you can have surgery where mm. you can remove part of the liver and mm-hmm. then you can be fine with that. Yeah. The other option is chemo mm-hmm. uh, therapy or radiotherapy. So those are the, the options that we were all given from all of these um, doctors was is chemotherapy, but also because it had already progressed to such a late mm-hmm. stage because he has metastasized yeah. lung, chemotherapy wouldn't necessarily be something that will help. Yeah. You know, but we still said, okay, we want to make sure we are given the option to fight through this. So she had chemo. Um, and we wanted to go ahead yeah. with the option of chemo, which yeah. was the only thing. Mm. Because there was one point where um, we thought, okay, before we made the decision to go with chemo, uh, where we went and get a second opinion mm. um, at King's College, I think uh, Royal Marston, they're yeah. a specialist in liver. Mm-hmm. I remember it was um, March 26, uh, 2014, as if it was yesterday. Yeah. I went with my dad and my mom. Mm. Um we went there and they talked through us the different various different options and they t- they also told us the same thing because they're meant to be one of the best when it yeah. comes to liver treatment and they told us the same thing that um chemo would be the only option mm-hmm. and at that point that's where we decided to then inform uh my mom's side of the family, family. Uh, can I ask you a question what yeah. in that mo- when you when you hear in that moment that it's progressed so far mm. and there's no other option. Mm. How did you, how did you cope with that? I know for me, I uh, almost blocked it out. Yeah. I kind of went on continuing with work. I, I, I didn't, I almost didn't know how, I remember my aunt and my aunt and my, my mom's best friend came around and they all told us, okay, she has leukemia. And then it's kind of like, I just went off and did, my no, my same normal there was no I couldn't process it and mm. I just worked mm. but how how did you cope with such thinking that she was coming to the end of it how did you cope with that but that's the thing yeah. I didn't think that he was coming to an end of it yeah. like you, like you yeah. it, it it was almost like okay this is the only option we have mm. we're gonna go through it we're gonna we're gonna fight through this yeah and also because my mom was also displaying that kind of uh, yes same with mine yeah. that kind of uh, yeah. spirit mm. we're gonna fight through this yeah eventually you know something is going to come out of it. Like yeah. that's, that's, that's really the mindset that I had, but also, um, yeah, 
part of me sort of blocked out that yeah. you know, possibility mm. of mm. you know um, her passing away because you kind of you kind of switch into that autopilot mode where yeah. you're like you're focusing on the now. Yeah. What can we do now mm-hmm. to make sure everything's you know okay for her yeah. and why? But also I had work. You know, I was traveling with work. I sort of cut reduce some my traveling. Yeah. You know my. Mm-hmm. Colleagues at the time were very supportive. Oh, my my boss at the time, who was the only one who knew at the time, was very supportive. She said, if you need to work from home, mm-hmm. you know, so I spent more time at home with my mom. So okay. throughout this time, because this form of cancer is super aggressive, you know, I, you know, she was diagnosed in Jan and she passed in April. So you don't, wow. you barely don't have enough time mm. to prepare for anything. Yeah. You know, mm. so at that point, my only focus was let's get through this chemo, yeah, and eventually see what we can yeah. do. Mm-hmm. So on March 26, when it told us, let's say that was the final final opinion, which was exactly the same thing that every uh, other yeah. hospital mm. had told us, it was more like, what what can we do between now? We need to inform these people because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you know, they need to know because yeah. until then, my mom was very adamant on keeping things yeah exactly like, exactly like mine no you know you, yeah. um because that's who she was yeah. you know and uh, she wanted to keep th- th- things discreet but part of us felt like we owe it to other people to mm. to share it so i remember my dad uh actually took a flight the next day went to the u.s wow um because he was like this is not something that i want to share over the phone mm. um, and I remember specifically that day when he left for the US mm. uh, my mom had actually come back home mm. since that at the time mm. and the day he left for the US was the time the same day that she was admitted back to the hospital oh, wow. for the last time mm. you know and uh, I remember specifically that day it was me and my brother uh, she kept complaining more stomach ache and then we had to take her to mm. the hospital because we're working on like um, what they called reducing her the bile level, like the bile level mm, down yeah. to sort of work on the jaundice so that yeah. it goes down a mm. bit. But eventually that got worse, and mm. then we took her back to the hospital, and that was the last time mm. she would ever she left home, and she would never never come back. Mm. So that was twenty seventh of March, and two weeks before she passed, mm. and I remember at the time. The whole, everything just from there felt like a blur because everything just went so fast because yeah. it was also Mother's Day. I remember we spent Mother's Day at the hospital. Mm. It was everything just, but still what really stuck with me was the fact that she was just calm and collected yeah. mm. throughout the whole time. And mm. that gave us a bit more encouragement, Yeah, you know? Mm. And um, yeah, so that's really, and then uh, two weeks later, I remember it was on 10th of November it was a Thursday um, we had decided at the time to move her to uh, one of those the homes to the one of those homes mm. where you basically when you have a ca- cancer patient you decide mm. to move them there that palliative, palliative care exactly or, yeah Hospi- a hospice. A hospice. Okay, exactly. Hospice, yeah. Sorry, I was trying to find a name yeah. in French. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, one of those hospices. I yeah. remember the day that we were supposed to move her on the tenth. I remember they called the hospital called me mm. at eight a.m. I was in the office at the time. You went back to work. Yeah. Because because the day before I went to visit her mm. and we were in the middle of like a big project at work. Yeah. And I remember specifically that time what she told me. She said. Go to do your thing, yeah. And then when you come back tomorrow, mm. you come and paint my paint my nails because she loved nail yeah, polish and whatever. Yeah. That mm. was the last thing that she said to me. Oh. I didn't know yeah. that that was the last time I would speak to her. Yeah. So, sorry. That's fine. <laughs> so I went to work that day, yeah. and I remember my sister and my dad went to the hospital because they wanted to be there when um, they were moving her. Mm. And I remember specifically, I got a call from my sister that day. And she said, she said to me, you need to come to the hospital. I said, why? I thought they were supposed to move. I said, no, no, no. You need to come now. Mm. That was like, first it was, sorry. First it was my dad who called me. And my dad typically gets really overdramatic with things, from with the smallest yeah. things. So when he called me, I didn't really take it seriously. Mm. So he called me around 10 and 
a.m. Mm. And he said, you need to come to the hospital. And I was like, why? And he couldn't really speak. And I was like, oh, um, you know, she's not uh, doing so well. I said, okay, but are, the, are you guys moving her? Mm -hmm. And then he wouldn't say anything. And then I hung up the phone because I was like, what's this mm. about? And then two hours later, my sister calls me and she had the calm. And my sister's super calm. Yeah. And when she's calm, you know something's it's up. Happening, yeah. And she called me and she said, you need to get her right here, right now. And I just felt like a shiver in my body. Yeah. And I was just like, I, I just, I was in the middle of a meeting mm. and I just stood up and my boss looked at me and I, and I looked at my boss and I said, I have to go. Mm. And my boss looked at me. She said, okay. Mm. She said, it's going to be fine. I said, I have to go. Mm. And I don't know how I got to the hospital. It was in St. George's Hospital in Tooting. Mm. I don't know. Everything just felt like a blur. I remember walking to the hospital and seeing my siblings, my two brothers and my sister and my mom just lying there as she peacefully sleeping. Mm. She was so beautiful. And I said, and that's when I realized that, you know, she was gone. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to give you a, a, a minute. Yeah. I'm going to give you a second. So you, so you, you made it just in time to, to, to see her at that, at that point. Yeah. 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 It's just one of those things that, you know, you always think back in that moment yeah. and obviously you can't help but feel sad. Mm. And you're always going to remember, but. Mm. And I think it's, it's also that thing that you can never, you can never be prepared for. You don't no. know what it looks like. No. And. To me, she was just sleeping. Yeah. You know, and it's funny, the the silver lining of it is that she was meant to go through chemo. Yeah. But it's almost like, you know, God said like chemo is something that she was, it was going to be another session of like yeah. pain. It's like, and it's, and, and it, chemo is aggressive. It's so very aggressive. aggressive. She was yeah. already, you know, um, part of me is actually, I'm glad that mm. it happened this way because if she had gone through, through chemo god knows yeah what it would have been like it mm -hmm. would have probably been been even more pain so it's mm -hmm. almost like she got spared that that yeah you know so that was uh that was very tough mm -hmm. it still is today but it's a very tough moment mm -hmm. and ever since you know i don't know for you but you j everything just happened everything is just a blur after yeah because you then inform the family yeah and then what happens afterwards is like you have so many people coming to your yes, house yeah and on top of that um we had to carry her body back to guinea mm -hmm. where we had to have a, a funeral there because so she was, was so decision. she was so she was buried in guinea she was buried in guinea, guinea. Mm -hmm. uh, because we had where we had most of our, my dad's side of family mm. my mom's side of family as well uh came to the funeral and it's one of those moments where you know in terms of grief you think that you will be allowed to grieve properly but mm -hmm. you don't really have time to process mm. because what I felt at that moment was you know autopilot okay right what do we need to do mm -hmm. what's next uh, because there's so many people coming to the house cooking and you have mm. to tend to them so you almost don't have time to think about yourself mm. I was going to say what has been the hardest thing to do what's the hardest thing about going through that grieving process in the early stages well in the in the early stages for me mm -hmm. I don't think I actually allowed myself mm. to grieve properly. Mm. From the funeral where you had so many people to like, you know, yeah. you know, sort of look after. Mm. Also my dad. Yeah, I say, because I think we're both in similar positions because our you parents know? were. Because I remember one of the time. things that my dad, my, the first thing my mom said when she first found out that she was diagnosed with um, cancer, mm. first thing she said to the doctor was, she looked at my dad, she said, I'm actually worried about you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what she said to the doctor. Yeah, I, I, and I yeah. always think back and I'm like, wow, yeah. even in that moment, she was not, not thinking, thinking about herself. No, of course not. Yeah. She was like, I'm worried about you. Yeah. So I almost, at that moment, at the early stage of the funeral, I really didn't have, I didn't even have time to think about myself. Mm. I was just thinking about what's going to happen to my dad yeah. mm. i hope he's going to be okay mm. you know and also because you have so many people you know mm. in africa it's like yeah 
some people that just show up out of nowhere. Mm. That's when you really realize how much of an impact you had in the yeah, communities. Exactly. You know, your mom did this, 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 and you're mm. like, wow, okay. Mm. I mean, I'm super grateful mm. that she had such a funeral because it was almost like yeah. she was celebrated. Yeah. You know, and coming back to London again, and I think when I listened to one of your podcasts, like it resonated with me a bit where I sort of blocked it out because one, I'm one of those people where I don't easily express myself. Yeah. So I tend to keep a lot of I things. I find that quite, su- what, like, quite surprising because I think once we, when we have spoken, you kind of really been able to just explain how you're, I guess, well, maybe because we've, we've been, obviously we've been through similar things. So yeah. there is that comfort in knowing that person understands what you're going through. Yeah. But also I think it, it comes with the fact that it because it was years later when yeah. we talked to, when yeah, we spoke course, yeah. and but at the beginning it wasn't easy i would say probably the most difficult thing was to express it yeah. it's almost obviously you go through different stages of grief denial or whatever mm. but i don't know it's for me it was more like it was not wanting to recognize that it happened to me yeah <laughs> you know because yeah. it's one of those things you're like wait it why is this happening to me? And then mm. unless you speak to someone and it might sound cynical to whom it's happened to, like you, you would not necessarily be able to understand, understand yeah. or even willing to share, Yeah, you know, mm. and especially, you know, within my, that's one of the first thing. The other challenging thing was within the family having to explain because we mm. were the only ones mm. at the time who knew about yeah. it and we wanted to respect our mom's wishes. Yeah. And I would get the constant questioning of the how and having to to explain everything was just such a difficult thing mm. that I just blocked it out. Mm. And the other the challenging thing in that moment was having to, how am I going to be able to contain other people's feelings? Yeah. So mm-hmm. you almost forget about yourself. Yeah. And you are too busy caring about other people's feelings 100 like percent, and i think it's and i think that's yeah. the most yeah the, for me it was the most challenging thing mm. less so today but yeah. back then it yeah. was because like i said my mom was everyone's person yeah i think i, I think you that's know? what i felt when we spoke before that resonated mm. with the fact that my mom it was the same thing she was a very very private person so nobody knew it, it was only me and my siblings mm. and then having to tell like i almost felt guilty like yes and the looks on their faces are how could you have not told us? Exactly. Carrying their anger. And it's like, yeah. this is what she wanted. And even her, some of her family were, my, like my grandmother, her, same as your mom, my mom's mom's still alive. Yeah. And she didn't know. Yeah, you know, my, my to, grandmother have, didn't know. Having to call her and then just like, but why didn't you tell us? And some yeah. people up until this day, like it's, it's only four, are still very angry. You yeah, know? me too. But at the same time, it's like, I also feel that that's what she needed to get through that time. You know, mm. that's how she needed to. It was just her and her faith, and I'm not sure how religious your mum was. Probably mum was quite religious yeah. as well. Yeah. But that's what they needed, and yeah. so that's how they had to face it. And that's what you have to respect. Yeah. So s- similar, same mm. for me. It's you know, especially when you come from big families. Yeah, and African, there's so Afri- many African, African, African families, families, especially. It's more of those things where, you know. Like you say, the guilt. Yeah, of it. I I held on to that for quite a while, mm-hmm. if I'm honest. And, and you know, to answer your question about what what was the most challenging thing, mm-hmm. the guilt of not having told them in advance. But then when you think about the circumstances, everything happens so fast. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, from the moment where we had to get second opinions, be hundred thousand percent sure mm-hmm. about this before yeah. we could actually tell mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, it was everything happened so fast. Mm. And when I look back, if things were to happen again, I think I would have done it the same way because at the end of the day, I wanted to carry my mom's wishes. Yeah. You know, so I think for me, having to deal with other people's feeling anger Mm. was also a very challenging thing in parallel to me blocking, not wanting Mm. to process my own feelings and keeping everything inside. Mm -hmm. And how I've overcome that, actually, because, you know, I know some people go through therapy. Yeah, because we've, we've had this conversation. Yeah, uh, some people we? go through different ways of, like, processing. Everyone yeah. has different ways of grieving and processing mm. grief. Um, for me, it 
happened in the form of a self-development course okay. that I did a couple of years mm-hmm. um, in 2016. So I decided to take on this course because I wanted to uh, be, I wanted to improve my self-expression because I okay. felt like having to keep things inside mm-hmm. would not necessarily make me feel happy inside. Of course, so 100%. if I had to put it in the most plain way. So... I took on this course. It was a three-day course uh, for like full days where you basically sit, sat in a room with hundreds of people Mm -hmm. from all walks of life Mm -hmm. that you don't know. Mm -hmm. And for some odd reason, I kind of found that a safe place. Really? And one of my fears is public speaking, so stage fright. So I don't know how I got the courage to actually go on stage it's basically a bunch of people that go there and talk about their um their story Mm -hmm. and like what they want to transform in their lives and what they want to improve in their lives Mm -hmm. whether it's like money relationships communication Mm -hmm. family whatever and you have people who haven't spoken to their family for like 30 years and they make you go through things Mm -hmm. where you have to like do a phone call to those people that you haven't spoken to like these kind of things that you would never think of doing so Mm -hmm. you kind of you get a bit of peer pressure Mm. and if you want you come to talk to the you know you go on stage and you come to talk about it so i remember it was three days so Mm -hmm. first day i went on first day second day i refused to go so Mm -hmm. they were make you do these exercise homework where you write down things you want to improve on things you want to do Mm -hmm. people you want to reconnect with and remember that specific moment i held a lot of anger Mm -hmm. because you know you know when you have death happening in your family especially when you have death of a close one the f- one of the first feeling you have you want to blame someone yeah. you either want to blame god or you want yeah. to blame someone yeah of course yeah and i realized that um from the relationship that i had with my sibling especially particularly with my older brother mm-hmm. our relationship wasn't that great to mm-hmm. begin with before my mom passed so i remember i, I used to resent a lot of the things that he was doing mm-hmm. that would make my mom upset mm-hmm. So when she passed, it's almost like automatically yeah. that shifted towards yeah. him, even was, if he was mm. completely and so that just shifted towards mm. him in terms of you're the eldest, you're meant to set up the example, like yeah. kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I can you know? I can resonate with that slightly as well. You yeah, know, so, yeah. because I felt like a lot of pressure sort of felt on me. Yeah. You know, in terms of, you know, with regards to the family. So I felt a lot of anger mm. at the time. And I and I realized that through that course that I was projecting a lot of that mm-hmm. uh, in terms of grief, but I was it was projected in terms of anger towards my brother. Mm. And I realized at that moment, I got present to the fact that I never got to share these things with him, but yeah. I was just holding things inside. Yeah. So I remember I wrote a letter to, to him. him. Wow. And I called him that day and, and I read the letter to him and I said, you know, I think, you know, something along the line of, you know, I really want us to improve our relationship you know family is everything to us it's something yeah. that you know mom stood for and this is me trying to like you know be more self-expressive mm. and he was so shocked because we were so distant at the point yeah. and he was so shocked he went to see my dad he was like dad you would never believe what wow. happened this is what <laughs> nana told me this is i hope this is not a joke yeah you know, this is, i'm not getting punked or yeah. anything <laughs> And you never told me. And then my dad calls me. He was like, this is what your brother told me. Apparently, you know, you yeah. guys are like talking now. So it was like a How did it happy feel moment. like having to pick up the phone and having to just tell him exactly how? It felt scary at first. But then if I felt a sense of relief. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure whether that's like related to like grief itself, but it's somehow connected because. Yeah, of course. Yeah made our it definitely improved our communication within the family mm-hmm. because one thing that i noticed when after my mom passed mm. first of all you noticed you noticed her absence straight away yeah, at home yeah because yeah. you know you know how it is oh yeah. uh, when she used to put the she, she used to hold the house together yeah. you know from the cleaning the cooking everything mm. so when that person is not there anymore it you feel it shatters, everything yeah. just falls apart yeah literally mm. everything just falls apart but also the communication falls apart. Yeah, that is, and it's, that is so in the family. So true. It's just that that presence, that that mother figure holds. Yeah. You know, if you are in a family dynamic with a mum, a dad, and mm. they hold everything without them. Exactly. And I, I don't know whether it was the same for you, but I felt that sense of I didn't. 
really appreciate, not like, obviously you appreciate your mom and you love her, but I didn't really appreciate that mm. until. Yeah, so I, I, I felt that. I mm. felt that the communication was missing mm. in the family. Like nobody was talking. It's almost like everyone was trying to deal in their own way, but nobody was actually talking about it. Yeah. So it's almost like it, it never happened. Mm. It never happened, but she's not here. Yeah. You know? And I, so that sort of lack of communication was something I wanted to reinstill again, mm. starting with my brother. Yeah. And then eventually with my dad. And you know, with dad, dad don't talk too much. Yeah. They, very bad expressing feelings. Mm-hmm. At least my dad is. Yeah, say exactly. Say so mine. I reached out to my dad in the mm. same way where uh, I was more open and honest. You know, when I, you know, especially this course, they make you realize that something might have happened in your life, a story. And then based on the story in your childhood, you then build on sets of behaviors yes. and attitude and characters around mm-hmm. it. But it's just built on the story. So yeah. I remember I was telling my dad about a story that happened back when I was a child about, you know, me getting terrible grades because they were so strict on yeah. my education. Mm. And I said, since then, I felt the constant pressure. I mm. wanted to be better. Yeah. And that nothing could ever be good enough. So that constant pressure on myself, mm. you know, and even when it came down to like selecting universities or whatever, there mm. were at some point I didn't want to go to the U.S. So I sort of admitted that this is something that I didn't want to do. And it didn't really, you know, it didn't really correspond to what I wanted to do mm-hmm. in life. So what he told me was like, well, I never knew that. Yeah. So if you don't tell me, how would I know? So yeah. that kind of like engagement and communication mm-hmm. sort of opened the door a bit to expressing more things. Mm-hmm. And I felt like over the last five, six years mm-hmm. now, our relationship has actually become stronger. Stronger because yeah. whenever my dad feels like talking to someone, the first person he would think of is me he Mm. he would just share things that i would not think that he would share with Mm. me in the past yeah so that course in in a nutshell has sort of helped and it's also helped me sharing Mm -hmm. in general because i felt like through sharing it became even easier yeah talking about it Mm -hmm. talking about my experience like what we're doing today Mm -hmm. you know so it was therapeutic in a way it wasn't therapy but it was therapeutic in a way it was kind of like a therapy in a a completely different Because I feel like the more form. you share, mm. you're, you're eventually going to touch someone. Of course, yeah. You know, somebody mm. out there who's maybe, who is going through the same mm-hmm. thing, has gone through the same thing. Do you think thing. you would do therapy now? Um, it's something I've thought of. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I would, but I've sort of taken my time with it. Yeah. And um, because... The course was one thing, but another way, I guess, of like processing was mm-hmm. through different s- silly things, really, like exercising. Yeah. Because uh, that's, I think, another form of like manifesting your yeah, emotion in a different mm-hmm. way. Um, I watch a lot of TED Talks. I don't know okay. if that helps. No, TED Talks are good. No. There's a lot yeah. of TED Talks about grief, about how grief mm-hmm. is not something that you can fix. Mm-hmm. You know, you never, you can never... Um, Grief is always there. Yeah, always there. In happy and sad moments. Mm-hmm. That's something I've learned over the past six years. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know how you have people who, I don't know if you've ever had that, but like people who will come up to you and we say, okay, you need to move on. Mm. You know? Oh. You know? Have I, have I had I don't know if you've ever had that. I don't think I have. I find that very odd. Like have, some have, people, you, have, have you had people? I, I, I often think that, you know, when we say it's, it's until it's happened to you. Yeah. Yeah. You will not understand. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying it because in a cynical mm-hmm. way that mm-hmm. it, it needs to happen to you yeah. to understand. Mm-hmm. But I just feel like there's that sense of meeting people. When you meet pe- people who've gone through the same experience like yeah. yourself. And, mm-hmm. and it's funny when that happened to me a few years later, mm-hmm. at least three of my colleagues lost their yeah, mom. Yeah. You realize that it happens so. You realize that yeah. it's, it, it, it was, happens to a lot of people yeah. and, you know, when people say, you know, you need to move on, actually, mm. you, you you can't move on. You can't, from, you can't yeah, move on. Yeah. If anything, you can only, you, with time, mm-hmm. it gets easier. Yes. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you move forward mm-hmm. with it, not, you don't move on mm-hmm. from it. I understand that they're saying we're not moving on, but I think even in terms with the podcast, I found mm-hmm. like, uh, when people ask, oh, what's the, the topic of your podcast story, et cetera, mm-hmm. and me feeling like, Am I just, you know, having to replay this all the time, speaking to different people, etc.? But then I think 
at the same time, I feel like with this podcast, with grief, it has a bigger purpose. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you need to allow, you need to relay your story out. Mm-hmm. Because if you can use your grief to help others, then it has, yeah. it almost has a, a purpose for your pain. Yeah. And I think that's what it is. And that, mm. and there are so many other people that are going through a yeah. similar story or that can relate in some sort of way. And that's how you have to kind of fuel it. Mm-hmm. I was going to ask you in terms of what, what has been the hardest thing of not having your mum here i think i know for me i i felt like thinking my mom's not going to be here when i get get married yes. you know and when i have children but what has what has been the most the most the most the most difficult thing i think it's uh no that's such that's such a big question what's the most difficult what has what's the hardest i think the hardest like you you pointed out in terms of like like special moments like yeah getting married because i went to so many weddings over the last you know previous years and i said okay wow this is yeah she's not going to be here for this Mm. special moment or like you know when you when you become when i become a mother Mm -hmm. if i become a mother like Mm. these moments where uh you feel like you can you want to talk she's the only one you can talk to Mm -hmm. and that for me is what i would think is hard like it's 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 funny you say this because actually uh my oldest brother uh, recently just had a baby. So oh, okay. it's my first nephew. He's one month old. And I remember first time I met him, I met him three weeks ago. First time I met him, my reaction was happiness, but also bittersweet. Because yeah. I was like, her first grandson, she should be here. Yeah. You know, those moments. And yeah. also with my brother, when he looked at me, he, we I think I think we all we both thought the same thing yeah and he also came up to me and he sometimes would ask me questions and i'm like well i'm not able to answer that he was like there's so many questions i want to ask her as a mom yeah how does she you know and i'm like wow sometimes i have like these moments where i'm like is this what it's gonna be like yeah every time yeah you have that but you also have those special moments that you celebrate like birthdays mother's day like when you have everyone celebrating mother's day those are like Minor it, thing. I think it's a, it's the, it's always, it's everything is bittersweet. Everything is bittersweet. Yeah, you know, but it's not. It's 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 not painful. It's it's sad. I I don't mm. know how to explain that, but it's one of those moments that you know that are always going to happen. Yeah, you know, happy moments mm. where you want her to be there, where you wish she was here. But you know, those just thinking about that makes it really hard to you know to imagine and yeah. to just go through it but it's it doesn't mean that you stop yourself from living your life yeah. and like in the way that she would have wanted yeah. you to live your life mm-hmm. if that makes sense no so okay. for me when i when i met my me- my nephew i was very happy yeah but at the same time i was very sad, sad. Mm-hmm. it's like you you're it was like a the, happy moment yeah, yeah. Like you're angry and you're upset but at the same time you think also oh, i want to do her proud i want to make sure yeah. that i live my life that to the fullest yeah as you as she wanted me to. Yeah. It's, it's so for my my brother was like, actually, when I look at him, I said, I want to give him what my mom gave him. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I want to be the best parent that I can be, mm-hmm. given what I've been given. So mm-hmm. when you when you think about that, you're like, you think about everything that she's taught us, mm-hmm. you know, as, as kids. And you're grateful. Mm-hmm. You can only be grateful because, you know, some people lose their parents at a younger age. Yeah. Exactly. They don't even get to know the parents. I lose. I lost my mom at twenty five, mm-hmm. which is considered adult age. But yeah. still, I still have so much to learn. So much mm-hmm. to. I, I I wish I had so much to ask her, but I know that I'm grateful for what she's taught me. Yeah. And one of the things she taught me is unconditional love. And yeah. I I know that if I were to have my family one day, mm-hmm. I will offer them the same. I will give them the same. Yeah. The same kind of love that my parents, mm-hmm. my mom gave me. Mm-hmm. So that's what I can take from that. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. And um, I guess it's kind of similar. I guess what are the most important life lessons you've learned from the passing of your mom? Mm. For me. Yeah, for you. For me personally, looking back at what was the hardest thing is mm. not um, allowing yourself to process. Yeah. I think for me, that's a that was a big deal for me mm-hmm. and having the whole notion of like blocking everything mm-hmm. is not necessarily going to help you mm-hmm. um really learning to process it and take your time yeah take your time because mm. 
I, I hear and I've seen a few videos, you know, I hear a lot of people say, oh, you know, asking questions, how long is this supposed to take? Well, there's no, there's no time frame. Yeah. There's no set time frame. You need to give yourself, allow yourself the time to process it, mm-hmm. regardless of whatever stage of mm-hmm. grief you are. Because through that, that's the only way you will be able to really move forward, yeah. not move on, mm-hmm. move forward. Mm-hmm. Um, I think really taking the time to process. Because for me, I first suppressed yeah. my feelings mm-hmm. and that didn't really help me. So eventually, you know, by through time yeah, and also t- through talking to people, through my course, through mm-hmm. self-development, to some people can go to th- therapy. Yeah. But really talking to people and really surrounding yourself with family. I think for me, that's really helped me mm-hmm. because when you're by yourself, you can easily get caught up in your yeah. own thoughts, mm-hmm. you know. And I'm grateful that, you know, my family and my friends, my closest friends have mm-hmm. been around to support me. Yeah. Um, even if my family today were all over the place. Yeah, because your family is spread out. So yes, we, yeah, we're all over the place, but we still maintain that sense of like mm-hmm. uh, family and communication. I mm-hmm. think that's what's really helped me. That's helped you. Yeah. I guess it kind of leads on to my next question, which is mm-hmm. very similar. Like, What advice would you give to any woman that has recently lost her mother and dealing with? Her grief, I guess we'll have a lot of people listening in that maybe are going through the stage of maybe a parent passing away or mm. looking after a really ill parent or mm-hmm. are in those beginning stages or middle stages. But what what would be like your key piece of advice? Um, I think it kind of relates to what I said before, but really mm. um, making sure you're, I mean, it's going to sound cheesy as well, mm. but making sure you look after yourself because yeah. it's very easy to get lost into other people's feelings mm-hmm. and and you forget about looking after your own self so going back to allowing yourself as well as a person to process yeah even if it impacts other people in the family mm-hmm. because for me I initially one of like I said I not only suppress my feelings but I was too busy thinking about mm-hmm. my dad yeah my family members mm-hmm. how they were feeling and whatever but that came at a cost for me yeah you know so even if it means having to go away and take take some time away and then come back into the space yeah give yourself that permission give yourself that permission to do that because Mm -hmm. you're also impacted as a person Mm -hmm. even if you know um it's your mom that passed away yeah Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. even though that person also impacted you know the death of that person also impacted other people but it's your mom yeah 100%. 100%. You know, the relationship that you have with your mom, at least for me, you know, it's it's something that's not replaceable. Yeah. So you need to allow yourself mm. to to process it. And even if it means that you, you go for a run, mm-hmm. you go cycling, you watch TED Talks, you yeah. go to therapy, but you need to allow that for yourself. Yeah. And there's, there's nothing to be ashamed of, mm-hmm. you know, if you say you're going to therapy, you say yeah. you're talking to someone about mm-hmm. it. Because you know in our community, when you say you're going to therapy, people yeah. are going to be like, what? Yeah, I love that. <laughs> going to therapy, like, what is okay, that? Yeah. You know? But there's, had... so, there's so much to unpack. Yeah. I mean, a whole like 25 years of, you know, your mother raising you. Mm-hmm. How do you, how do you get over someone that brought you into this world? I think yeah, it's, but the thing is you don't get over it. Yeah, you don't get over it. You don't. You, you just, don't, you don't get yeah. over it. You just, with time, you mm. learn to deal with it mm. by allowing yourself to process it but you with time you move forward eventually yeah. it gets easier it doesn't get better necessarily mm. but it gets easier that's easier. how i would uh, mm. i would describe it i was ask you one last question i was mm. thinking about it on my way this is something that i've thought of a bit if you had like, one last conversation mm. with your mom what do you th- what, what what would you say to her or one last Oh God! No, what would you say? To, so I didn't even. So you this many there. things. Yeah. What's one thing that you would, I guess, thank her for? What would you thank her? Yeah, thank her for. What would you say? Um, I guess I would. I mean, so many things. Yeah, comes to mind. But what really pops up at the moment is thank her for being who she was. Yeah, because if she wasn't who she was I don't think I would be in this position today yeah. in terms of education in mm-hmm. terms of where I am in my life job wise because 
and also based on the the upbringing that they mm. she's given us mm. you know when i today because of the the teaching that she brought she gave us mm. i'm in the position where i now take the time to go back to guinea every yeah. year mm-hmm. which is not something i was doing before, um, before. Mm. um part of the reason is because my dad's moved back now yeah and that also allows me to be open to the the legacy that she's left yeah she's always been like i mentioned before she's always been into education especially mm-hmm. for children and i know that at some point i would want to go back to guinea and mm-hmm. do something yeah about it i don't know what yet mm-hmm. but i definitely want to be involved in the in the community so if she wasn't who she was yeah <laughs> i i that's that's what i would thank her for oh yeah you know for like the love mm-hmm. and for the teaching that she's uh, mm-hmm. you know brought us Thank you so much, much you. for coming on and for sharing your story. Well, I knew you were coming. I was like, I'm so thankful you've been able to like completely articulate yourself so well. Thank I you think, for having me. I think a lot of people can take a lot from from your story. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you.